So now I want to shift to, to discuss uh, program evaluation using individual level data. This would be the more ideal situation for evaluating a program that is using individual level data for all the reasons that I discuss with the limitations with using group level data. And there are different kinds of evaluation program uh, evaluations using individual level data. The first I'll talk about is the randomized designs. So these are commonly referred to as pragmatic trials. Because of the randomized nature of the studies, it eliminates selection bias, selection to the specific program that is, not selection into the study. That isn't, a, that isn't something that randomization pre prevents. And the idea here is that we're basically assigning persons to different types of care and then evaluating for the health outcome. This is probably something that you've come across in other courses in your, in your program uh, since you are studying a health promotion path of, of, of your MPH. So you can think of these types of studies just like the randomized clinical trials, but instead of randomizing individuals to treatments, treatment A versus placebo, for example, here you're randomizing subjects, individuals to program A versus another program. So here is an example of a randomized program to evaluate uh, a health service. And this was looking at, it was called the Link for Health Cluster Randomized Trial. This was published in 2017 in PLOS Medicine. And the, the premise was that there were are gaps in HIV care continuum leading to poor health outcomes and increased HIV transmission in Swaziland. And so the objective of these researchers were was to evaluate the effectiveness of a combination intervention strategy versus the standard of care modality that was already available for the people in that, in that region. And the outcome that was measured was linkage to care within one month plus retention in that care at tw after 12 months after a person was, was deemed to be HIV positive via screening and testing. So the standard of care, which I don't remember off the top of my head, I have to go back to the publication, was basically what was already in existence in terms of providing care to an individual after they were told that they had HIV. And then this other approach that, that, is, that was viewed as more um, as experimental, if you will, was a combination approach using um, a different a strategy of contacting the individual, um, more follow-up with them to ensure that they receive the necessary care for their HIV infection. And the results are shown in the bottom of this slide where there, the combination program is reflected in black and the standard of care in, in red. And essentially throughout the person's course of evaluation, there's a stark difference between the standard of care and the, and the combination program occurring as um, sometime after one month and it, and it persists out to 12 months after screening, after HIV testing, essentially suggesting that this, this other, this new approach to following these patients, this combination intervention strategy was essentially more effective in, in retention, in maintaining retention of these HIV positive volunteers compared to the standard of care approach. Now I wanna shift and talk about non-randomized designs used to evaluate programs. These are performed when randomized designs are either too complex in nature to perform, or perhaps they're just cost prohibitive, or more importantly, when it's unethical or challenging to randomize individuals to one program versus another. And the view with these is that randomized clinical trials are viewed as impractical, to assess complex interventions and or complex problems. So for instance, if we're interested in understanding um, childhood obesity and programs targeting childhood obesity, extremely challenging to do a randomized clinical trial for a program or an intervention because there's, it's often true that there are going to be multiple elements to that program that would need to be in place. So it's not just education, but it's education, diet, um, exercise, etc. that would need to be applied. And it's very tricky to randomize people to all of that versus none of that. 
we can do what's called a historical control non-randomized design, which is basically a before and after approach, where you compare people who receive care before and after implementation of a new program that's designed to target some public health question or problem. <clears throat> now, given this design, sometimes the data before and data collected after are not perfectly comparable because you have different types of people, perhaps, who were measured before and versus those who were measured after. And that there may be differences that are observed in the data due to another program factor or just essentially a temporal change. There are also what's called simultaneous designs where we're interested in comparing the groups of people who receive the program versus not receive the program. So these are basically cohort studies, if you want to think of them like that. And this is where the exposure is given to one group and the exposure is the program. Another approach of a simultaneous design is a utilizer versus a non-utilizer. So the problem with utilizer, no utilizer design is it does suffer from self-selection bias. It attempts though to manage this by characterizing some prognostic profile for those who use the service compared to those who didn't, and then adjusting for those prognostics in the analysis. So in the passing of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, in part of that was this hospital readmission reduction program, which imposed penalties on hospitals who had or that had higher than expected readmissions for acute myocardial infarction, CHF, and pneumonia among Medicare beneficiaries. So here, this is, this is among those hospitals that are getting Medicare reimbursement. After the ACA was passed, those particular hospitals would be, would be fined or had higher penalties imposed upon them. I shouldn't say they were fined, but they had higher penalties imposed on them in, in the sense of how much Medicare reimbursement they received. If they had higher than uh, normal or higher than expected rates for readmissions for these particular um, outcomes. So this particular study that was published in 2016 was to compare trends in those readmission rates for targeted and non-targeted conditions among patients hospitalized at the hospitals that were and were not penalized under this program. And here are some of the results from that paper. And the green line, which is the line on the top line in all four of those figures, represents the rates for those particular outcomes in the hospitals that incurred those penalties. And then in the lower line, the, 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 the red line is the are the rates for the hospitals that didn't incur those penalties. And then you have uh, these horizontal lines, or these vertical lines that essentially correspond to time points when these um, reviews were performed. And what this essentially suggests is that compared to the, the hospitals that had the penalties the, and those are the non-penalties, there really wasn't a, an overall change over time in the rates of these particular measurable outcomes as well as the target non-target conditions. But that overall, and this is per the authors, there was a slight downward trend in the risks or um, I'm sorry, in the risk adjusted rates for these events. So they conclude that this part of the Affordable Care Act that imposed these penalties did have an overall um, effect in reducing the overall rates of these particular, these particular outcomes. I recommend you read the paper and <clears throat> see if you feel the same about their conclusions. <clears throat> Another kind of simultaneous design is the, called the eligible, not eligible design. And this is another design with an attempt to manage that self-selection bias issue that we discussed a second ago. This is where we assume eligibility versus non-eligibility and that, that that's unrelated to the prognosis or the outcome that's being measured. So for example, eligibility may essentially be type of employer offering this particular service and another employer just doesn't offer that service. So the person, there's no self-selection bias here because the person's working somewhere where, where, where the program's either available or it's not. 
Another kind of individual level study is a combination design, and this is where we're using both before and after designs along with program or no program designs or uh, eligible, not eligible designs. And then finally, there's the case control design, which as we all know now is a design where we're going to look at uh, the outcome, a group of people with the outcome, a group of people without the outcome, and then look, look backwards for their exposure. So here with this approach, we're sent the exposure is the health measure or the service that was that was given. Here's an example of one. This is a case control study that used a retrospective chart review approach. And the question of interest was to identify a population of high utilizers of an inpatient medical service at an urban public safety net hospital in, in the southern part of the United States. Cases were defined as persons with three or more admissions in a single calendar year, and they were defined as high utilizer patients. And then the controls were persons who had only one to two admissions in the same calendar year. And the results were essentially that there were factors that contributed significantly to whether or not someone was a high utilizer patient or, or, or not, or, or was a control. And those factors included the type of health care coverage they had, um, their prior use of recreational drugs, being homeless as well. And so this is kind of a um, combination of a, of a typical case control that we've discussed as well as a case control pro, uh, evaluation for a, um, a program, because here they're looking at the access to health care, uh, being Medicare or Medicaid. So just a, a question to throw out there after going through some of that information is, after a hospital in a major city adds a high-risk pregnancy and neonatal intensive care unit, the rate of adverse childbirth outcomes doubles. Administrators are concerned that this indicates that the new unit is ineffectively run. Which of the following is a reason that this concern may be unfounded? A, incidence of congenital birth defects has been increasing. B, childbirth procedures and personnel are still the same as before the addition. C, the type of population served by the new unit has changed. D, many of the new mothers attending the unit are older at first birth. And E, none of the above. So let's think about this for a second. If, if a hospital creates this new program or unit uh, to treat high-risk pregnancy, and subsequent to that, the rates of, child, of adverse birth out, childbirth outcomes doubles, what could be going on here? Could it be that the unit is ineffectively run? Or could it be that perhaps the type of population served by this new unit has changed? C. That's probably the answer. And it makes sense, hopefully, to you, which in that after the creation of this unit, the population changed because people were going there because they had that specific problem. So comparing the rates before the creation of that unit to the rates after that unit would be problematic because you're no longer comparing the same two types of populations so or the same population. So just a kind of a general way to think through some of these some of these ideas when creating a new health program or health system and how do we interpret results before and after. Here's another question for you. This is looking at in-hospital case fatality for 100 men not treated in a coronary care unit and for 100 men treated in that coronary care unit. And it's looking at that data according to three grades of severity for myocardial infarction. So on the left-hand part, you have those that were not treated in the CCU, and then the rates and numbers for those treated in the CCU. Now, you may assume that this is the only hospital in town and that the natural history of the myocardial infarction has un not changed during the same reporting period. So the authors concluded that the coronary care unit was very beneficial for men with severe MI, which is this middle row, and for those in shock, which is the bottom row, because the in-hospital case fatality rates for these two categories were much lower in the coronary cardiac unit compared to the non-coronary care unit. 
so the question for you is is this conclusion correct?